I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Now you're recording. Now I'm recording. Anything that you say can and will be used against no, uh, used against you in a court of law. Um, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for today. Thank you, Father, for your incredible love, your words of wisdom, your words of love that you sing over us. I praise your name for setting free the captives, for sharing your heart with us. Thank you, Father, for opening the eyes of the blind, unstopping the ears. You have done a mighty thing. Lord, I just pray right now over Little Falls, over this area, over Morrison, Todd, Crow Wing, Stearns, and Sherburne counties right now, Benton County. Father, I just pray. Huh? Sherburne? Yeah. I pray, I pray, Lord, that these counties, that your love would blanket these counties. I pray, Lord, that you would break the oppressive uh, chains that are here. I pray that you would confuse the enemy, that the plans of the enemy would be broken in Jesus' name, that you would have them fall into the, the nets that they have laid for people, that they would fall into their own trap. They would get entangled and begin to fight amongst themselves in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Father, I claim the victory that you have sung over us, that you have proclaimed in Jesus' name. Um, Lord, I just, I just stand as witness to that victory. We are seeing it now, and we sing it all week long. We will continue singing it, for it is your victory. Hallelujah, that we don't have to see to believe. Thank you, Father. I pray now that as we dive into the scriptures that you have given us, that we would have ears that would hear. Lord, I pray that you would remove anything, any outside confusing voices. In Jesus' name, I pray that they would be gone. I pray that spirits of doubt and unbelief would not be allowed. In Jesus' name, to anybody who's listening to this. Pray, Lord, that this, the spirit of fear would be silenced in Jesus' name. There would be no fear. That we would see your heart and your love for us and your good intentions towards us to bring us into unity with yourself. You who are the highest good, the most perfect expression of giving, selflessness, and love. I just praise your name because you have allowed us to participate today in your work. I just thank you, Lord. I thank you. Lord, I pray that any stones or blockages or tears or or weeds that have grown up in our heart would be removed now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray right now that your spirit would convict us of any sin that we need to confess before you right now. Lord, just in the quietness of this moment, so that we can hear your voice clearly. Thank you, Lord, for your promise that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's only love and forgiveness. I want to thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, prepare us for the message that you would give. Lord, I pray that my words would only be from you. Put your words in my mouth. I don't want to speak anything that's not of you. And if anything does come out, Lord, may it fall to the ground and not be remembered. May you only be lifted up and only your name. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Feel four. You didn't say God is good. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Hallelujah. Thank you. All right. Uh, feel fair. Turning death into life. 
revelation of the law. The last set of slides are all dark. This one is sort of ironically springy, um, particularly when we take a look at what it's talking about. Um, I want to do a little recap, though, from the previous sales, because you got to know where you've been to know where you're going. So, uh, seal one was the white horse, and it's the inspiration of where we're going. Um, Yeshua is, the, is portrayed as this victorious one. He's given a crown of victory, and he comes riding on the white stallion who is charging forth the symbol of war, and he said that he's going to be a conqueror, and he's coming to conquer. What he's coming to conquer is the contested area of our soul. And he brings with him a heavenly vision of a, a group of people who will be a kingdom of priests, they will be fitted to rule and reign with him in holiness and righteousness. And we talked about how that was all sort of set up in the heavenly uh, vision just prior to the opening of these seals. Seal 2 brought us a fiery stallion. This steed brought with him a sword. And there was going to be a distinction that's made between righteousness and unrighteousness. You have to choose with this seal what side you're going to be on. It's the great battle cry of who is on the Lord's side. You have a division in families, like Jesus said there would be. He didn't come to bring peace but a sword. And father would be against son and mother against daughter and daughter-in-law and so forth. And there would be this distinction that would be made. Those who would be followers after God and those who would not. If you chose to follow the Lord at this point, even to your own hurt, then you would be accepted by Him in a way that is a deeply intimate way. In fact, it says that Christ would be in you. And I'm taking from the epistles and so forth. We went through all of this in depth earlier. And I love the verse that says, even if we're faithless, he is faithful. Why? Because he can't deny himself. He has unified himself to you. So you are completely secure. There is no way you can be separated from the love of God. So you have a new identity. Your identity is found in Christ. And with it, you have perfect acceptance, never again to be rejected. Seal 3 brings the black horse. And the black horse, the rider has the scales. Remember? Yeah. And those scales, they are uh, a picture of famine. It was said that you would work all day long and you'd only have a measure of wheat. Or all day long and only three measures of barley. And we talked about how barley was sort of the poor man's food. It was the first thing of the harvest, and it's representative of the faith that is necessary at the very beginning of our walk with Messiah. And as we begin to continue to, to know him and to grow in intimacy with him, that's really the thing we need more of. In fact, three is symbolic of faith in the scriptures, like the three avot, or fathers, who were characterized by their faith and their ability to hear the voice of God and respond to it. The one measure of wheat, wheat is always offered with the sacrifices. It's a picture of the uh, righteousness of God through the word of God. It's, it's symbolic of the, the very bread, the Torah, the instructions that God gives, and their righteousness and their holiness. And so you have both these things going on here. And you have also um, the oil and the wine that are not harmed. The oil is the anointing of the Spirit that cannot be removed from you. They can't be harmed from you because God's Spirit, once He anoints you, you are sealed indeed. And gladness that comes with the wine because wine is for the gladness of a man's heart. And it's somehow, even though... There will be this weighing out and these difficult times. Um, there's still a joy that is there that is from the Spirit. It's unexplainable joy that God gives you. 
as you learn to submit to that season that he has you in, even if you don't have all the comforts that you would like to have or all the uh, foresight that you would like to have. You walk by faith in this. So then that brings us to seal four. And seal four I have as a revelation of the law. Um, seal four, uh, I think the four part is really important because numbers in the Bible mean something. They aren't just arbitrary. So the fourth day, what happened on the fourth day in creation was the sun, the moon, and the stars were created. And everything builds off of that Genesis account and in the creation. Now, it's very interesting what happens on the fourth day. It's the first time that God says anything about authority. He says that the sun, the moon, and the stars are given authority over the times and the seasons. And so the idea of time and authority and the heavens all sort of wrapped up in four. So is a revelation as to when those feasts or or seasons are going to occur. In fact, uh, the ancient Israelites would go outside and look up in the night, and that's how they would know what month they were in, when to celebrate certain holy days, and so on. They would look for the sign in the skies. It was a revelatory thing. It also is the uh, fourth time that we see this interesting phrase, Brit Olam, which is the everlasting covenant of God. And this occurs at the, at the Mount Sinai when God comes down to his people and he reveals to them his law in a written way. He's spoken to them before, but now he put it down in writing. And uh, we all know the Ten Commandments, you know, is chiseled out into stone for the people. And um, this was an incredible experience for them. It was meant to be a covenant with them where he was going to be their God and they were going to be his people. And um, the the story goes that Moses comes down, he's, he's getting within earshot of the camp, and the people have already broken the covenant before they even get it off, you know. Uh, and so um, a whole new set has to be created and so forth. But it's the giving of the law. And, and it is of no consequence that the fourth feast of the year, according to the biblical year, celebrates this giving of the law, this covenant with God and his people. And so that is um, uh, Shavuot. Moses in Deuteronomy, he has a song that he sings. And in that song, the Lord speaks through him. I call as a witness, what? The sun and the moon and the stars and the earth to stand as witness against you, Israel, and how you respond to my covenant. And you'll see that repeated again in the prophets later on. And we see it again in Revelation as you see all of heaven and earth sort of witnessing what's going on uh, with the people. So nature is always sort of involved as almost jurors over whether or not God's people are acting according to the royal law that God has set up. The other thing that happens with four is that at that point, we have, let's see here, day one, we have the light that's established. Day two, we have a separation of waters from waters above and waters below. Day three, we have a separation of water and land on the earth. So now we have land scooped up and vegetation sprouts. Day four, we have sun, moon, and stars. And the stage is set at that point. Everything is laid for the infilling of the world. Because on day five and day six, we get birds and fish and animals and man. And so there's an infilling that happens at that moment after you cross over four. We'll see there's an infilling that will happen after seal four that is mirrored in that creative process. Okay, so we have hope of what is to come. Let's move to the next one. That's you. There you go. (laughs) Revelation 6, 7 to 8. This is the text. When the Lamb broke open the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living creature call out, Come forth. And behold, I saw a green horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Death's domain followed him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine, death, 
and by the wild beasts. It doesn't quite sound like our background looks um, because it's full of death, but we'll see. We mentioned that from heaven's perspective, things are very different than from our perspective. There. That's as good as I could get for a green horse and a rider. Uh, just as a reminder, the horse is is symbolic of a battle. You're going into a battle. And we talked about how the soul is our contested ground. Okay, The spirit is firmly held territory of the Lord. We are sealed by God's Holy Spirit living within us. The flesh is condemned. Your flesh is going to die someday. And there's no way to stop it. It's appointed once for man to die. But the soul is an area that is contested where the spirit and the flesh war against each other. And that's our promised land that we're going in with the Lord to conquer. Okay? And that's really what we're talking about here. The horse is for battle. The green there, it's usually translated pale green, sickly green, pale horse, whatever. The word in the Greek, though, is chloros, like chloroform. It's literally green, like chlorophyll, not chloroform. It's a poison. Okay, chlorophyll, sorry. Okay, so, but it's the chloros is the green color, and it's used four times in the New Testament. That particular word is always used in reference to green growing things like grass and trees and things that have life. So this is not a pale, green, sickly kind of thing. It's a green horse. Sorry, it looks sort of neon. But <laughs> but it is, it's, a, it's a green, a verdant green. Okay? Um, and so this is going to give us a, this odd picture of death. It's not the first time that we have a, a rider that's named death. And then behind him comes his domain, but he's riding on top of something that's living. And it's a, it's a message to us that death rides upon that which will bring life. And we're going to see what that is. Now, death, before we move on, is a separation. In humanity, when we say we die when our body is separated from our soul, our identity. And then, you know, the shell goes in the ground, our identity goes where it goes, hopefully to the Lord. Okay? Um, figuratively, we say, even in our own speech, that person is dead to me, or that thing is dead to me. We say it's cut off from us. So in a figurative sense, we even use this terminology sometimes, uh, in, in our modern language. Spiritually, from God's perspective, the most important thing is our connection of our spirit with him because he's spirit. So when our spirit is cut off from God's spirit, then we are dead to him. Okay? So you might live, but be spiritually dead because you are not connected to God. Death domain... Uh, is followed by a couple of different things here. We have sword, death, famine, and wild beast. Now, we've seen sword, death, and famine in the previous two seals. And then we've added wild beast to it. Um, I think this shows a compounding of effects, things that can be one on top of another on top of another, increasing the pressures upon us. Because, you know, I think we mentioned this before, that the ultimate goal is for the flesh to be literally driven out of our soul. And as you go along in this process, it takes more and more to drive it out. It's a higher level of refinement that's happening as we're going through. Sword, things or people or opportunities that are taken from us by the hand of the foe. Somebody comes against you and, and now you become a victim and you're having to deal with the consequences of someone else's sin against you. It could be a murder or adultery or children who are stolen from us, jobs that are lost because we stood up for righteousness' sake, for our faith. could be unexpected 
Or maybe it's a time of war. You perceive that it might be coming and you've had to deal with anxiety for a period of time until uh, the threat is realized. Death is separation. It could be willful or accidental or natural. It could be literally someone dying and going in the ground. Or it could be a separation, a move. Maybe someone that you had hoped would stay with you, but because of a falling out has been separated from you, even just emotionally, even if you're still close together. It could be surprising, or it could be something that happened and lingered for a period of time before that separation is final. Famine, a starvation, or meager supplies and resources. It's a long, slow thing all the time. It just drags on and on and wears you down. It may be a lack of emotional or physical intimacy. It could be uh, something that's more tangible, a literal financial or um, some sort of tangible famine that's going on in your life. And then we have the addition of wild beasts. And I think this, this points to the flesh nature. This is what happened when we were created in God's image, but then when we fell, we became like beasts, and then we began to run off of impulses in our ourself, you know, a, a lust for one thing or another, food or position or power or uh, sex or whatever it is that's driving us. And so these impulses, they aren't even rational. They're just impulses from our nature that drive us. God said, uh, to the children of Israel when he promised that he would drive out the people before him. He says, I'm not going to drive them all out in one fell swoop. I'm going to push them out little bit by little bit, lest the what? Wild beasts take over you. And so there were things he was going to work with you. You ever wonder why you don't just immediately become sanctified in one fell swoop? <laughs> there needs to be a filling of the good fruits of the spirit in your land so that those wild beasts don't overtake. And as you continue to, you know, stretch your borders, the flesh will be pushed out. Um, Okay. I think we'll just go right into the next slide, Nathaniel. Paul deals with this domain of death. What is the domain of death? I thought Jesus conquered sin and the grave and death is overcome and all this kind of thing. So how can death have a domain? Well, if you go back to the section there in Revelation, it says that they were death was given an authority. There's a certain authority that is allotted to him. And we're going to take a look at what this is. Romans 7, 10 through 12. Um, I'm reading from the Passion Translation, which is just a very readable version of this. I once lived, this is Paul speaking, without a clear understanding of the law. But when I heard God's commandment, sin sprang to life and brought with it a death sentence. The commandment that was intended to bring life unto me brought death instead. Sin, by means of the commandment, built a base of operation within me to overpower me and put me to death. So then we have to conclude that the problem is not with the law itself, For the law is holy, and its commandments are correct and for our good. Death only has an authority in our body where there is the flesh springing to life and sin being brought out because of that. You know, it's sort of this weird phenomenon. As soon as you're told you can't do something, All of a sudden, the only thing you want to do is that one thing. You can have anything to eat you want except for that cake. All of a sudden, that cake looks really good. You could not even like chocolate cake, but all of a sudden, you want that cake because someone told you, don't have it. You know, Eve, this is what she suffered in the garden. Have any fruit you want except for that one right there. And that's the one that she desired, that she lusted after. And that's the one she ate. Because the giving of the law somehow causes, stirs up our flesh to where we want that thing that we're told we can't have. It's not that the law is bad. It's that our flesh is stirred up by it. Paul um, 
as, as we continue to walk with the Lord and we are submitted to Him, I, I want to make this real clear. This is, this is a person who is submitted to the Lord already. They are, they're already wanting to do the right thing. Okay? Um, he says he's hearing God's commandments and he's agreeing with God's commandments that they're good. You don't do that if you, unless you already have a heart towards the Lord. If you're someone who is not caring about the Lord, you're following some other God, you aren't going to agree that God's commandments are good. So this is for somebody who already has their heart, you know, turned towards the Lord, and yet they're feeling the struggle. That doesn't make a lot of sense. It's only going to get worse for Paul here in the next few uh, screens. He, he, the more he tries, the harder it gets. This is sort of like um, the rich young ruler that Jesus meets. And the, the ruler comes to him, you guys know the story probably, comes to him, you know, says, good teacher, what must I do in order to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, in effect, says, well, do these things. And he lists off some commandments. And the guy says, I've already done all that. I've been doing that forever. Since I've, since I've been young, I've been keeping those commandments. But something in him said, it's not enough. There's got to be something I'm missing. And so he comes to the Lord. He says, what is it that I'm missing? Jesus knows his heart. He looks at him and he loves him. And he says, well, sell everything you have and give to the poor and come follow me. He calls him to be a disciple. And that call has this effect. Maybe it, it speaks to... Uh, a sin that Jesus didn't mention, which is covetousness in his soul. But he says, I can't do that. And he walks away sad. Notice it isn't Jesus who walks away. It's the ruler who walks away. He's the one who makes the decision, I can't do that, and walks away sad. There's something about that flesh that gets stirred up, that sin nature um, that's in us. So why the law? The purpose of the law is in the next set of verses. So did something uh, meant to be good become death to me? Certainly not. It's not the law, but sin unmasked. The law reveals the sin. The law defines the sin for us. That produces my spiritual death. The sacred commandment merely uncovers the evil of sin so that it can be seen for what it is. For we know that the law is divinely inspired and comes from the spiritual realm, but I am a human being made of flesh and trafficked as a slave under sin's authority. This is the unfortunate state of the fallen man. Everybody's born like this. We inherited this spiritual genetic problem from our forefathers. And um, as such, while we recognize that there is a good law for those of us who are, our hearts are, are seeking the Lord, the nature that we were born with is incapable of fulfilling the demands of that law. And Paul is here, he's trying to describe uh, the frustration as he's recognizing, he's face to face with his humanity. And we got to remember, Paul was really a good guy from the external experience, you know, Outside, he, he did all the laws. He knew all the Torah. He had memorized all the things he needed to memorize. He was zealous for the Lord. And yet, the more he tried to please, the more he fell from the, the requirements of the law. Galatians 3, 23-25 says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. It was keeping us and showing us our need. The reality of our nature is, the next one there, I'm a mystery to myself. I love this. Paul gets really frustrated with his own self. I'm a mystery to myself, for I want to do what's right, but I end up doing what my moral instincts condemn. And if my behavior is not in line with my desire, my conscience still conforms 
or sorry, confirms the excellence of the law. And now I realize that it's no longer my true self doing it, but this unwelcome intruder of sin in my humanity. For I know that nothing good lives within the flesh of my fallen humanity. The longings to do what is right are within me, but the willpower is not enough to accomplish it. My lofty desires to do what's good are dashed when I do the things I want to avoid. So if my behavior contradicts my desires to do good, I must conclude that it's not my true identity doing it, but the unwelcome intruder of sin hindering me from being who I really am. He has an aha moment here, and he goes, man, it's not really me who wants to do these sinful things. It's this other thing that's in me. And that's an important distinction to make, that there is a part of us, our true identity is knit with Christ. But there's this other thing that we're fighting against, this flesh nature that we're fighting against and pushing out. That's our true foe. See the next one there. So though my experience of this, or through my experience of this principle, I discover that even when I want to do good, evil is ready to sabotage me. Truly, deep within my true identity, I love to do what pleases God, but I discern another power operating in my humanity, waging a war against the moral principles of my conscience and bringing me into captivity as a prisoner to the law of sin, this unwelcome intruder in my humanity. What an agonizing situation I am in. So who has the power to rescue this miserable man from the unwelcome intruder of sin and death? I think this is just a picture of Paul being in torment in his soul. It's an increasing frustration with human nature. What began as a recognition of God's ways through his perfect law led Paul to desire to obey, to resist his, his nature that was doing wrong, to beat it into submission. But the more he tried to beat it into submission, the more he couldn't do it, the more frustrated he got. And he started entering into this cycle of, of sin and then feel bad about it and confess it and then sin again and, and he just goes around and around in a circle trying to, to please God by doing and he gets just more and more frustrated. The more he looks into the perfect law of God and he sees its requirements, the less he's able to keep them. And this frustration just keeps building till he says, wretched man that I am. Who can save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is a, a perfect explanation of a second crisis. Some people would call the second crisis. You're already trusting in the Lord. You already know him as your Savior. And really, in seal two, the second descriptor where you have your loyalty is confirmed. And in seal three, where you're walking out in faith and, and you're trusting him for, to meet your needs and everything. You're already doing these things. But now, at this point, you're, you're probably looking pretty good to the people who are around you. Like they would, they would say, you're, you're an honest follower of God. They would look at you and identify you as a, a holy person, maybe. But inside, you know what's there. You've seen it by studying God's Word, and you know that there's, just, there's still stuff in there that's not good. You may be doing good things, but you're doing them out of the wrong motive. And you can't control it no matter what you try. You, and you feel like you're losing your grip more and more and more. That's what's described here. He is in a place of torment because he knows it is, it's not matching up with the requirements of a holy God even though he looks probably pretty good to everybody around him. And he knows that he can't overcome himself because he tried. That's the second crisis. Who's going to save me from this self-righteousness? I need help. Oh, we're missing that slide. Oops. So the end of the matter is this. Sin gives death its sting. And the law gives sin its power. The only reason why sin can say anything, it's like your accuser, and this way it's sort of personified. It's like sin is standing up and accusing you. Ah, he did it wrong. Oh, she did it wrong. 
And the reason why I could even say that is because the law of God has been established. So that's what he's saying there. But we thank God for giving us victory as conquerors through our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. I give all my thanks to God for His mighty power has finally provided a way out of the sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess cycle through our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. Because it's His righteousness which is perfect alone. It's His perfect dealings. And it's Him living through us by her Holy, the Holy Spirit that enables us to follow His Word. So that's sort of our perspective of it. We so said there's always two sides. There's, there's the earthly side, and then there's the heavenly side. Well, Jesus walks through, you know, we talked about Him being presented as the Lamb that was slain, who was worthy to open the scroll and to un- reveal the seals, okay? Well, why is He worthy to do that? And it says it's because he conquered sin and the grave. He was perfect and, and he walked that road. Well, let's think about just for a second what it was that he did when he walked the road here on earth. He was born. He was announced that he was going to be the one who would be bring peace to earth. And that's very much like the announcing of him as a conqueror of our soul. He also had a distinction where he had a sword put between him and his family. Remember when he was 12 years old, he was sitting in the synagogue uh, and he was talking with the rabbis and his parents had moved on. They were going home from the feast and they realized Jesus wasn't with them. So they had to turn around and come try to find him. And they find him after several days sitting there talking with the rabbis. And they said, don't you know we were worried about you? And he says, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? There was a sword between him and his earthly relationships that was cut. He wasn't being disrespectful. There was just a distinction that was made. His loyalty was to his father. Then he started his ministry at 30 years old, approximately. And he was baptized and then driven into the wilderness where he was tested after 40 days. And that um, that difficulty... The very first testing was, hmm, why don't you just turn these stones into bread? Why don't you trust in yourself to make good decisions and get to the end goal in a certain way that maybe you can avoid some pain for yourself? He was given these different testings to not rely on the Lord and His timing and His provision, just as uh, we all have our heart motives weighed and we all have to walk by faith and we have to walk in purity to the law as it's revealed to us. Jesus did the whole thing. He fulfilled every portion of the law in purity. And he walked doing exactly what he heard the Father say. He walked, you know, um, or sorry, speaking what he heard the Father say and doing what he saw the Father doing. So he walked in this constant dependence, constant uh, communion with the Lord and faith of him. He didn't even have a place to put his head. He didn't have a steady income, so he wasn't reliant on himself at all. He was just taking whatever was needful for him as the Lord gave it to him. And so he fulfilled that one as well. And now seal 4, we're going to look at the end of the law for our flesh is death. And that's where he's going. He's going to the cross. We're going to start looking at his perspective, John 12. This is six days before he heads to the cross. And he's preaching in the synagogue and there's some Greeks that come up and they want to see Jesus. They approach Philip and Andrew and say, can we see Jesus? We want to talk with him. And um, so Philip and Andrew come to Jesus and say, uh, you know, there's these Greeks who want to talk with you. (laughs) And his response is, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Let me make this clear. A single grain of wheat will never be more than a single grain of wheat unless it drops into the ground and dies because then it sprouts and produces a great harvest of wheat all because one grain died. He goes into this little speech on agriculture which doesn't seem to have anything to do with the question that he was posed. They just want to see you. They they don't want a lesson in agriculture. But this is his response. Of course, he knows that he's speaking of himself. 
And there's going to be a glorification that's happening. Now, glory means a weightiness. There's going to be some weight that is added to him as he does something that the first Adam never did. The first Adam, when Eve presents the fruit, he doesn't go, Eve, no, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have eaten that. Oh no, what have you done? He may have had the opportunity to die for his wife if he had done that, but he didn't. Now we're going to see Yeshua as the second Adam. He's going to, instead of taking from what will be his bride, the church, he's going to die for his bride, the church. And he's going to glorify his name as the son of man, the second Adam, in a way that the first Adam didn't do. Adam, The first Adam did not protect his wife, but the second Adam will. She's, he's going to make a provision for her through his very life. So the reason why I think Yeshua is worthy to open these seals is because he walked through them first. He did everything that has ever been required of us, except he did it perfectly. He goes into this uh, little agricultural picture. Um, of course, we know that's what's going to happen. He's going to die, and all salvation is going to be opened up to mankind, and intimacy with God will be opened up to mankind because of his death, a great harvest. But he's also talking to his disciples. And they, too, are going to follow after him. And they, too, will offer their lives in one way or another so that a harvest can be reaped. The next section, uh, John, says, The person who loves his life and pampers himself will miss true life. But the one who detaches his life from this world and abandons himself to me will find true life and enjoy it forever. If you want to be my disciple, follow me, and you will go where I'm going. And if you truly follow me as my disciple, the Father will shower his favor upon your life. This goes right back to the rich young ruler. Perhaps he was thinking of him. If you pamper your life, if you hold on to this life and you're not willing to lose it, you're going to miss true life. You're going to miss the favor of God upon your life. You can only find that in Christ. Sometimes following Christ seems sort of romantic, you know. Uh, you get to see the miracles, see the demons flee. You get to have the power of God and the anointing because Christ is in you. But you also get to eat where he eats and with whom he eats. You also get to sleep where he sleeps and he didn't have a home for his head. You get to walk where he walked, even in the Samaritan villages even the road of Calvary. You might get words of wisdom and knowledge, but you also get nights of weeping over Israel and prayers that don't stop from nighttime till morning. You get a compassion that causes you to forget your own food while you're serving others, and it will lead you to death because that's where he went. You have to be satisfied with the life that God ordained for you. Jesus was a truly spiritual man. He didn't deny his humanity. He had emotional struggle and toil. Even though I am torn within, my soul is in turmoil. I will not ask the Father to rescue me from this hour of trial. You catch the timber that's there? He was not trying to say, you know, it's okay because God has this. He acknowledged the turmoil that was within him. He acknowledged the fight that was within him. We can't cover that up because that would be denying our humanity. Even Jesus recognized that there was a fight. And his will is what led him because his will was in submission to the Father. I have come to fulfill my purpose, to offer myself to God. So, Father, bring glory to your name. He did what he did because he was loyal to the Father in the midst of this great trial. In this case, he was bearing witness to God's love and justice. 
So there's an a example. I pulled up some uh, quotes here from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German Lutheran pastor. He was concerned with the church because it seemed at the time in which he lived, which was right around World War II, uh, that the church was more interested in keeping traditions than in following Jesus, regardless of the cost. And so he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship to encourage people to understand what it meant to be a true follower of Christ. There was a lot of Christians in name only in his day. And so um, he has this quote here, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. It was a, a radical thought that was put out at that point in time. Most people just wanted a warm, comfortable, moral Christianity. They wanted to be not rocked too much. And here Bonhoeffer says, no, you can't have that and really be a disciple of God. And World War II, as Hitler took over the nation and started to control things, he also controlled the church. He started to say what you could preach and what you couldn't preach, how you could pray for people, who was allowed in your buildings, whether or not you could actually go and visit the people who were your congregants. And he started to put all these restrictions on the pastors. And um, Bonhoeffer stood up against this. He spoke out publicly against it at um, the expense of being uh, arrested. As he went on, he recognized the evil of Hitler and what he was doing to the Jews and other marginalized peoples. And so he got involved in a, a plan of espionage to spy on what Hitler was doing and ultimately to create a plan to assassinate him. And he eventually was caught and sentenced to death. He was uh, put in jail and then he awaited a sentencing. His, this uh, second quote here is the observations of the doctor who saw him just before he was hung. He said, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer before taking off his prison garb, kneeling on the floor, praying fervently to his God. I was most deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed, so devout, devout and so certain that God heard his prayer. At the place of execution, he again said a prayer. And then he climbed the steps to the gallows, brave and composed. His death ensued in a few seconds. In the almost 50 years that I have worked as a doctor, I have hardly seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God. It may have seemed tragic for his objective of getting Hitler didn't happen. Hitler ended up committing suicide two weeks after the death of Bonhoeffer. So it seems even more tragic that if he had just waited a little longer, maybe he could have lived. It's even more tragic if you realize that he was engaged at the time and had hopes of family and a future. And all was lost. And yet, he knew something that perhaps we need to grab a hold of. You see, uh, Eric Metaxas makes this comment about Bonhoeffer's whole viewpoint on death. He thought of death as the last station on the road to freedom. Because once the soul is completely submitted to the Lord, the only thing that's left to go is the flesh shell. And that flesh shell, when it's shed, you're in the presence of the Almighty. And he gives you a new body that is incorruptible, cannot be touched by sin or tainted by death any longer. And he had such a heavenly vision that it provided a stability that still speaks as a witness to us today. So going back to John, in John 28, after Jesus has just announced his submission to God the Father, the Father speaks back in this booming voice from the sky, and he says, I have glorified my name. And I will glorify it through you again. This speaks to the nature of God being a creative God. I have done it. And the redemptive side. I will do it. It's the beginning and the end. 
the Aleph and the Tav. This concept is constantly throughout the scriptures. The, cre- the one who created mankind, the Messiah was there at the creation, would also redeem mankind. And in so doing, as we walk this out too, we find our deepest needs met. We've talked about a couple of those needs. One is for perfect acceptance, which we find in our unity with Christ. One is for security that as we walk through through life with him, knowing that he will provide every need that we truly have, and we become secure in him as our faith grows. And the last need that we really have to have is significance. What does my life matter? Why am I here? Does, does anybody care? If I were to die, would anybody even show up at my funeral? Those kinds of thoughts. We have this need to know that what we're doing is important. It may seem a little unfair that God allows death to ride into our life and to take things away from us in whatever way that happens. And yet, when death comes in and starts taking away, it's usually from that soul area, that contested area, that is keeping us from true intimacy with the Lord. And as those things are removed out of the way, the rocks, the weeds, the tears, all that stuff, as it's getting cleared out, then we can be in a better union with God. Until we become like Bonhoeffer was and many, many, many other martyrs, where we are bold and unafraid. And we know that what we're doing, our life, is significant because we believe in truth, in reality, that God has, in fact, created good work for us from beginning of, of the foundation of the earth, and we are walking in those. And we know, because we know the Lord, that intimacy now has been established. And in knowing God, we also know his heart towards us and towards others. You know, Jesus, when he was walking to Jerusalem, he sets his face towards Jerusalem, and he can't even, his face was like flint. He couldn't be turned knowing what he was going to suffer because he knew what he was going to gain. He was going to gain his precious bride and he was willing to go to the cross. He was also willing to go to the cross because God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And he was working in communion with his father for the goal of redeeming a world that was lost. He knew that what he was doing, though it cost him everything, was significant. And Bonhoeffer knew that what he was doing was significant, though it cost him his life, his hopes and dreams of happiness. And we can know that too. As we walk in union with the Lord, we can know that what we are doing as we work with him is significant, no matter how long our life lasts. The other thing to remember is that death rides on life. As death occurs in our life, life springs forth. When the seed goes into the ground and dies, life springs forth. And in abundance, harvest comes. So any time God goes in and takes something, separates you from something, know for sure It's only a matter of time when life will spring again. It will come up and it will be more abundant than that one grain that had to die. That's the ever-giving nature of God, the ever-expanding nature of God. It's His character. Even our universe proclaims it. God spoke. And when He spoke, the world was came into existence and, and astronomers tell us today that the universe is expanding. It's still expanding. It's ever expanding. That one word of God is still expanding. And it's been thousands of years. That's his nature. Well, we have a response. The people that were standing around, they heard this big booming voice. And... uh there were some who just didn't get it at all. I mean, they they heard it, but they attributed it to thunder. 
They couldn't even tell that it was words or anything. And there were some who heard it, and they thought, well, this is sort of weird. I think this must be a spiritual something. Maybe an angel spoke to him. And so they recognized, but they didn't get the message. They recognized there's something going on here beyond the norm, but they couldn't hear the message. Jesus says in response to their uh, responses, he says, the voice that you heard was not for my benefit, but for yours to help you believe. Well, who's he talking to? The two groups of people prior either didn't recognize it was a voice at all, or they thought it was maybe an angel, but they couldn't understand what was being said. But here Jesus says, the voice you heard was not for my benefit, but for yours, so that you believe. He's talking to his disciples. They're the only ones who could discern it. Those who had a relationship with him were the only ones who could hear his word accurately. And it's for their sake that God spoke and that they would believe because he knew that they would go through their individual deepest test that they will have ever gone through at this right at this juncture. He gives them some hope. He says, from this moment on, everything in the world is about to change. The ruler of this dark world will be overthrown. I will do this when I'm lifted up off the ground and when I draw the hearts of people to gather to me. He said this to indicate that he would die by being lifted up on the cross. Now, he's in the presence of the crowds, the other two types, the ones who only saw flesh and the ones who couldn't quite perceive what the message was. He's in their presence as he's speaking to his disciples. And they really don't get it. The next response that they have is, die? How could the anointed one die? The word of God says that the anointed one will live with us forever. But you just said that the Son of Man must be lifted up from the earth. And who is the Son of Man anyway? So they understand what Jesus is saying from an earthly standpoint. They, they get that he's saying he's going to die. But now they're severely confused because they don't understand how this could possibly be. Why would the anointed one die? Remember, just a few days before that, they were waving palm branches and going, Hail, the king of the Jews! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! So now they're thinking, maybe we got it wrong. Because in their understanding theologically, He's not supposed to die. He's supposed to reign forever. God with us, you know, forever. Not only that, that lack of understanding and their preconceived understanding of what God was supposed to do in this situation leads to a confusion, which leads to a doubt. Maybe we got it wrong, which leads to unbelief, which leads to them walking away. And this is the progression of the flesh when you try to perceive spiritual things according to fleshly things. It's those who are followers of God that can accurately hear his voice and understand the spiritual sides of things. Jesus gives a final call to his disciples. Once again, he's really talking to the disciples here because the other guys, they cannot understand this message. Jesus replies, You will have the light shining with you only a little while longer. While you still have me, walk in the light so that the darkness won't overtake you. For when you walk in the dark, you have no idea where you're going. So believe and cling to the light while I am with you so that you will become children of light. The call is, if you hear his voice, respond now. Respond today. Walk in the light Because the light is here. It's shining right now. Now, praise the Lord. When Jesus died and rose again, he he gave a promise to his disciples. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I won't leave you as orphans. I will give my spirit to you to reveal all, reveal myself to you. That's the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit, or one of the big purposes of the Holy Spirit, is so that he will reveal Christ to you, in you. And so, this is the light that we walk in. But his disciples were going to have a brief moment where they were going to have Jesus taken away from him, them, and they wouldn't see that light. And that's what he's referring to. But I think that the admonition is the same for us today. If you are seeing the light now, make the choice to walk in the light and become children of light. 
We want to embrace even the death that God deems as good for us so that we can ride out in victorious life. We don't choose the death. God chooses the death. We don't choose the timing. God chooses the timing. We choose to submit to what God brings. And then we experience His resurrection life through us. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you that you only seek our good. You only want to draw us close to you. And you will not stop for anything, to remove anything that would hinder us from loving you in a holy, pure way. I thank you, Lord, for you are jealous for us. You yearn for us. And we desire you not because of our own uh, our own self, but because you first loved us. And we're responding to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Lord, I just pray that your people would see you, they would behold you in a new way, and that they would have the courage to trust in you and respond to you and your love. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father, for the words that were spoken. Lord Jesus, there's a lot going on. And we love you. And I rebuke any lying spirits in Jesus' name that would cloud the hearers of this message and that there would only be truth right now. And I rebuke you from trying to steal the words that God has given. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so, I love how the Lord does this with messages where He gives one and then He gives the other side. To complete it. Now, Father, I, I need I need your your help with the words you've you've given me. I have seen your affliction. So as you are going through this seal four training, unless you submit to it, God's got no ball in this court. Dog in this fight, rather, to say, I'm going to deliver you. Go to Second Samuel real quick. Hopefully I can make this short like I did last week. Second Samuel uh, chapter 16. Nathaniel, can you get the great piece, please? Starting at verse 5. When King David got to Bahurim, a man belonging to the family of the house of Saul was just coming out. His name was Shimei, son of Gerah, and he was yelling curses as, as he approached. He threw stones at David and at all the royal servants, the people and the warriors on David's right and left. Now, the setting for this, David is like, oh, stink, my son's going to kill me. So he's fleeing with his mighty men. <sighs> Shimei said as he cursed, get out, get out, you worthless murderer. Uh, I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard, HCSB. The Lord has paid you back for all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you became king, and the Lord has handed the kingdom over to your son, Avshalom. Look, you are in trouble because you're a murderer. So here's this guy. Um, so David was the anointed of the Lord, the beloved of the Lord. In fact, David means beloved. Okay? Uh, and he, he had the Holy Spirit on him. He's anointed king. Uh, the Lord has anointed him. And... It, he doesn't just have issues, family issues. He's got a subscription, okay? So, now he's running from his own son who wants to kill him and take over the throne that God has given him. So Shimei is throwing stones and dust and insults at him, saying, you worthless piece of garbage. Then Avishai, son of Tzuriyahu, 
or Zeruiah uh, said to the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and cut his head off. Okay, so now let's, let's follow this. David's getting an affliction. David signed up for this. Did he not? From the beginning. He signed up to do the Lord's will. That was what he was signed up to do. He said, I want God's will all the days of my life. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23. Okay? He says, the Lord is my portion. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I don't want anything else. Okay. Let's put you in some seal training then, son. Let's put you in, in some loss. Uh, these are all seven sons. Uh, Jesse, don't you have any more? Well, we got a little boy out there in sheep. So he had eight sons. Didn't you say all your stuff? Okay, talk about feeling like the red-headed stepchild. Okay? So David said, I want the Lord always on my side. He was one of the epitomes of seal training. Here's what, here's what David said. The king replied, sons of Seruyao, do we agree on anything? He curses me this way, not perhaps, because the Lord told him, curse David. Therefore, who can say, why did you do that? Then David said to Abishai and all his servants, Look, my own son, my own flesh and blood, intends to take my life. How much more now this Benjaminite? Leave him alone and let him curse me. The Lord has told him to. Perhaps the Lord will see my affliction and restore goodness to me instead of Shimei's curses today. I want you guys to write, if you are able to write some of these. I did a search where God says, I have seen your affliction. I have two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, twelve sections in the scripture. Genesis 31, 42. Jacob says, the Lord has seen my affliction. Exodus 3, 7. God says to Moses, I have seen the affliction of my people. Job 10.15, The Lord hath surely seen my affliction. Hosea 5.15, I have seen the affliction of the people. Acts 7.34, Hosea 5.15, I'm sorry. Um, Acts 7.34, God, when, when Ste in Stephen's speech, the Lord has seen the affliction of his people. Second Samuel 16.12, I just read it. David said, perhaps the Lord will see my affliction. Hannah, in, in 1 Samuel 1.11, the Lord ha, has seen, my, will look upon my affliction. Okay? And Luke 2.25, that's a, uh, Simeon says, Behold, God has been gracious to his people. And he has looked upon Israel's consolation. And now your servant may die in peace. Genesis 29.32 Exodus 4.31 Deuteronomy 26.7 Psalm 25.18 Now that particular one, if you think of Psalm 25, is a section. The secret counsel of the Lord are for them who fear Him. But yet, He looks upon their affliction. There's something, when you go through SEAL training, you will get afflicted. This world is nothing for you, folks. Nothing. Just submit to it. Stop trying. God who looks over our affliction... He has seen our bondage to sin and doing things our own way. Finally, he says, this is our affliction. And he's seen to it and he sent Jesus Christ. Paul says back in Romans 7, Leanne quoted it, where he said, I do the things I don't want to do and I don't do the things I do. Oh God, who's going to save me? Oh God, I'm afflicted, I can't do this. What do I do? Thanks be to Jesus Christ. Folks, if you are afflicted 
because you've been walking this road and you're, you're just kicking, trying to let go, leave me alone. No, God is, He is knocking on the door trying to get your attention. You're doing things your own way. You need to stop. Stop covering it up. Stop hiding it. Stop trying. You ain't going to win. Let him break you. Famous prayer of Welsh Revival, 1905. Bend us, O oh God, bend us and don't break us like an oak. He who stiffens his neck will have it to reproof will suddenly be broken beyond healing. Proverbs. Guys, allow him to see your affliction. Stop trying to be good. It ain't going to work. Stop trying to be good. Stop. Stop. Stop trying to say, oh, I'm going to serve God. I love you, Lord. I'm going to do... No, just stop. It ain't going to work. I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to be holy. No, it ain't going to be... It ain't going to work. Holy Spirit, you got to do this. I'm poor and needy and I'm being stripped. Lay it bare. Lay it bare. Have, have thine own way, O Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I'm the clay. Have you surrendered? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? All for Jesus. Everything. My, 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 all my evil and my good. There's, there's an evil way where we think sex, drugs, all that stuff. There's a good way where, oh, I'm, I'm trying to be good. I'm, I'm not drinking, smoking, chewing, or go with those doing. And then there's God's way. We you allow the afflictions of this life to rip you apart. It's okay. Be honest. I'm suffering. I'm struggling. It's okay. Allow Jesus to heal you. That's what the fourth horse is doing. Cares of this world, the troubles and trials and tribulations, God's trying to perfect you. God's trying to transform you so that you can overcome the world because, because the Holy Spirit is greater than you. Let Him do it in you. Stop fighting. So, if you haven't done that, um, come to the altar. Whether you're here at the altar in Battelle or you're at home listening to this, go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I've really tried and I've failed every time. I keep having the sin confess, sin confess, sin confess, and I'm just in a, in a rut. I'm sorry. Even with pride, God, I'm sorry. I'm a mess. I look down on people. I think I'm better than people. I think I have it all under control. God, I don't have it under control. Would you please forgive me? Change my heart that I may know you. Oh God, break me. Keep me on my knees. I don't care what it costs. I want your SEAL training. I want you to make me a fit vessel for your good purposes. If, if, you, if that's what you want to do now, please come. We'll pray. Um, send us an email, family at gmail.com. We'll pray with you. Father in heaven, I've delivered my soul. Delivering the gospel. Jesus loves. He died on the cross and he rose from the dead. He went first. Jesus wants to heal us from our sexual bondage, our sexual addiction, any perversion in our life, wrong thoughts, wrong viewpoints on relationships. He wants to restore the role of father and brother. But we need to let him. Lord Jesus, we need you to do this in us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.